exactly the dynamics of this object. So anyway, as long as we are taking our operator to be l long enough, as long as we can imagine that indeed our magnon are evolving in the rather big world, uh, we can just focus on these S matrices and try to see how far we can go in solving our problem. And here we are helped by the supersymmetries. So this, ma this ferromagnetic vacuum that I've mentioned before happens to be a particular state. It's one of these BPS state, half BPS state that preserve uh, half the total number of supersymmetry. And uh, <clears throat> thanks to that, there are some residual supersymmetry uh, 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 on this, on this uh, spin chain or on this wall sheet. So uh, the precise form is given by uh, this central extension of two, two product of uh, super uh, Lie algebra, this uh, super, super group, sorry, this uh, projective SU2 slash 2. So there is a left and a right part that precisely rotates the left and the right part of our magnon. So our magnon falls in, in, into some bifundamental representation of this group, okay? And each one of these factors rotate uh, one part of this magnon. What is important about it is that uh, about this, this algebra is that there is this central extension here that actually uh, include in particular uh, the energy of the system and uh, this <coughs> intimate connection between the symmetry or the supersymmetry of the, of the problem and the energy that appear as a central extension allows one to exactly determine uh, the energy of, of a magnon as a function of the coupling. Okay? So the, uh, the reason behind that is that this representation should be short at any value of the coupling, and this, uh, as usual, puts some constraint on the central charge that must uh, satisfy some, uh, some quadratic equation of sort, which just translate into this nice relationship. What is even more is that the symmetry is powerful enough to entirely fix the S matrix. So the scattering between magnons, which uh, factorizes between the scattering of the left and right part of the magnon up to a global an overall abelian phase here is also uh, fixed by symmetry. Okay? So the symmetry or the supersymmetry is extremely powerful and almost immediately give us the full answer to our problem. Okay? So we don't have to think so much. Well, once someone has fought uh, for you, you don't have to think so much. So what about three-point function? So in the case of three-point function, we are interested in merging, as I said before, free spin chain on a particular vertex. Okay, so we want to uh, contract them in a, in, a, in a particular way, contract this, this spin chain state and, and, and get a number out of it. Okay, that's what, that's what we are in, interested in. So we can use this pair of pants picture, the, the usual picture for the string uh, splitting or joining uh, to represent what we have in mind okay, at, at a cartoon level. And as we will see, this is not actually just a cartoon, and we will draw a lot of uh, inspiration out of it. So at weak coupling, we exactly know what we have to do, what is this vertex about. It's rather simple, essentially uh, it's just application of weak theorem. So we prepare our state. Let's take this state to be just the vacua, okay? Free BPAs for simplicity. So we just prepare our free state with length L1, L1, L2, and, uh, and L3. We put them in, a, in, a, in, a, in the vacuum of the quantum field theory, and we do the, the contraction, just the weak theorem. So what we find is that a certain amount of uh, uh, field in this operator here will connect with operator two, and another amount will connect with operator three. The number that dictate this, the topology here, this uh, what we call bridges, okay, are, are fixed just by the kinematics, if you want, by the number of field. Okay, it's a straightforward algebra to determine uh, how, many, uh, how many fields here are connecting the operator one and operator two. So from, from there to the final answer, it's really just like a, a combinatorial problem, an extremely simple combinatorial problem, and, and it gives this, this very, very nice expression, uh, which was derived by Cyberg and collaborator a long time ago. So what I want you to take from it is uh, that, we are effective, that we are dealing with this, uh, that this vertex we are dealing with can, can be thought that we coupling as being made of two, um, two splitting points. So here is one splitting point in the front where the line uh, diverges, and there is another one in the back that we can see, but due to the cyclicity, uh, it must be there. 
And these two splitting points are separated from each other by a certain amount of line, which essentially translate into a distance in a spin chain metric. Okay, so each line corresponds to one unit of spin chain. So this length here are telling us that our two splitting points are separated from each other by this uh, particular amount here. So what about finite coupling? So if we want to make progress at finite coupling, we must, we must rob this uh, Feynman uh, diagram-like picture because we don't really know how to, uh, to draw all the diagrams. Well, this we probably know, but we don't really know how to compute all these diagrams in the end. And uh, if we want to use integrability, we should also look for another method Another way of thinking about this object that, that does not precisely rely on this uh, weak coupling intuition too much. So our idea was to uh, open the problem into two. So a bit like uh, we were opening up the cylinder before to, to simplify a little bit the dynamics. Uh, here we wanted to do the same for the free point function and to cut it into two. So uh, the simplest way we could find of a more symmetric one of slicing this object is to think about it as being made of two hexagons which are glued together at uh, every one edge. Okay, so we are gluing uh, uh, along this dashed line here uh, our two hexagons. So I hope this is the hexagon. There is one in the front again and there is one in the back which is closing the other. So what the physics which is coming with this decomposition of a pair of points into two hexagons is that our free point function should eventually factorize this into two uh, hexagonal objects, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, which, uh, which we have just identified. Okay? So this factorization is actually not uh, uh, just factorization. Uh, what we have to, to, to do, we have to be a little bit more precise with what we are doing at the level of the state. So when we have magnons, uh, like these rapidities here, this momenta represents some magnons on the spin chain. So when we have magnons which are traveling on the spin chain, and when we cut the object into two, there is some probability that the two magnons are in the front, or some probability that the two magnons are in the back, or that one magnon end up in the first hexagon and the other one the second one. And we should, of course, keep track of this information. Okay? So when I say factorization, what I mean is uh, essentially the sum of all the possible way of cutting uh, this wave and into two. So our recipe is that we should, uh, as I say, sum over all possibilities. And uh, what do we sum over in the end? We sum over this uh, amplitude for uh, creation of magnons on a particular hexagon. Okay? So we imagine that we have this piece of wall sheet with this hexagonal form. In particular, it's a piece of wall sheet with uh, three asymptotic domain, if you want. There is like two far past and one far future. So it's, uh, it's, it's an object with a, with a sort of conical excess uh, uh, at its center of mass. And uh, we, we, we are interested in what are the amplitude for creation of particle out of this uh, conical excess, if you want. Okay. So this, this uh, non-trivial background can produce magnons and we are interested to understand uh, what, is, uh, what are the amplitude for producing a certain amount of magnets. So if I write down some formula, uh, I, will, I will think about my, my hexagon as being some, some, some ket, H, some bra, sorry, H, uh, that can contract, that can get contracted with uh, three uh, um, spin chain state, uh, one for each H here, one, two, and three. So, um, in general, we can always consider a case where all the excitations are living on the same edge, and then by using some trick, we can actually uh, do some, uh, we can cross our magnon to a different edge. This is a, a crossing transformation. That's a detail, okay? So, our problem boils down to something which is much more simpler, that might not be striking yet, uh, but, uh, but it is really simpler, which is to compute this particular amplitude. Okay. And uh, the reason it's simpler is that in integrable system, uh, there, there exists a lot of method and ideas for uh, determining this kind of form factor, okay, for solving this kind of form factor. So the main tool here is, again, to use a symmetry. I'm sorry, I, I'm way too slow. I have to, to speed up. 
So the main tool, again, is to use the symmetry. So the three-point function will preserve a bit less symmetry than the two-point function. That's obvious because we are sticking one more operator. And uh, in the end, what we find by doing some, some uh, uh, quick analysis is that the symmetry that remains is actually the diagonal subgroup of the symmetry of our spin chain. So on a three-point function, we cannot rotate left and right independently. We have to rotate them both together. Okay? So we are left with one PSU2 slash 2. But here again, the symmetry is enough to, to, to fix uh, a big chunk of the result, uh, of the problem, sorry. And in particular, if we just have two magnets in the game, here again, the S matrix uh, show up and happens to be the only possible way of contracting the left and right part together. Okay? So this object is uniquely fixed by symmetry up to a scalar factor, this H12 here, which has to be determined dif differently. If we combine this with integrability and with a little bit of guesswork, making some assumption, then we can convince uh, ourselves that the simplest possible uh, on that that generalize this previous picture here uh, to n magnon form factors, so to the case where we have arbitrarily many uh, magnons on the edge, on one on the edge of our object, is, is just given by replacing the two by two ace matrix before by its n by n counterpart, which we know can be factorized as a product of two by two ace matrices. So this is our main uh, conjecture. And once it is combined with uh, the solution for the abelian factor, the scalar factor, it gives us a full answer to our hexagon amplitude. So what remains to be done is to glue this hexagon together. So here there is a little bit of uh, uh, technical details for how to do that. Uh, I wanted to show you an example where we are picking a particular operator uh, to be non-BPS, to be excited, the other one remaining in their ground state, in their vacua. <coughs> so in this case, we can write a very sharp expression. Uh, uh, there is some conversion factor, which is a bit irrelevant here. What matters is that we can write a very sharp expression for uh, the amplitude corresponding to our processes on the hexagon, and this just spit out numbers. So here is an example of the numbers that we get. Uh, from this asymptotic formula that I just wrote down, this one, this asymptotic hexagon formula, uh, we just get rational number in, the part in this particular case. And if we compare with data, we, we obtain, uh, we, we observe a, a, a wonderful agreement up to these uh, zetas, okay, which appears at two loop uh, in, in, in the bottom case. So these zetas have a very size, uh, has a very nice interpretation. Uh, they come from the fact that, as I said before, uh, the asymptotic description is only approximate. When we put magnons in, uh, in finite volumes, they also interact, they interact with themselves, but also with the virtual uh, excitation that can wind around these cycles that we are introducing, this uh, finite uh, cycle. And, uh, <clears throat> and this gives rise to some extra correction. We can, we can take into account this correction in the case of our uh, uh, three-point function in our hexagon framework. The idea is that this, this hexagon will start talking to each other by exchanging uh, magnons uh, along this uh, virtual channel, which we, which we call mirror channel. So of course, this creation and absorption of, your, of virtual magnons that can propagate through this, this cut here, any one of these cuts, as a cost, at weak coupling, they, they are highly suppressed if the bridge, so the, the size that separate uh, um, the number of line of weak contraction that separate our two hexagon is huge, okay? But in the simplest, set, in the simplest case that we were considering before, they will already uh, contribute at, uh, at two loop, okay? So we can write, just by using our uh, hexagon expression and by analytically continuing a magnon to this uh, mirror channel to, to effectively mimic the effect of this virtual excitation, we can, we can write down uh, uh, an integral expression of this type that should accommodate this effect, okay? So we can do that and we can carry out the computation that's that's a little bit more demanding than what we were doing before because we need to carry out this integral. But the nice thing is that this integral now has the potential to, to spit out some zetas 
And when we, when we do the integration carefully, we, we actually obtain perfect agreement with all the data that we know up to free loops. Okay? So this approach is working very, very nicely. Uh, we can also, uh, uh, so we are thinking about trying to do more tests at higher loops, so you could ask why is this so much interesting and so on. Uh, the reason is that our approach starts uh, having trouble when uh, we produce virtual particles that can go around the puncture. So this uh, so-called wrapping or winding effect uh, comes along with divergences in our picture. Okay? So these divergences are sort of IR effect or UV effect, depending on how we think about this subject as uh, I mean, if we think of this puncture as a puncture or as half infinite tube and so on. And the idea will be that they will correct the wave functions, that they will induce some sort of vertex free normalization that we must take into account uh, in order to properly uh, uh, accommodate for all the finite size effects in, uh, in our system. So it raises many questions like can we actually do that? Can we accommodate for this, uh, for this finite size correction? And how do they relate with? Uh, with the thermodynamical beta on that equation that precisely resum all this, uh, this effect in the, in the spectral case. Okay, so uh, my conclusion is that integrability brings powerful new strategy for, for computing quantities at, at any value of the coupling in, in planar and equal to four super young mills. So it allows us to attack increasingly complicated objects, okay, and find all loop expression or conjecture for them uh, like for gluon scattering amplitudes that I did not talk about, but which exist, or structural constant, et cetera, et cetera. So here I've shown you a particular strategy for the structural constant that consists in cutting opening and eventually gluing it back, uh, cutting opening into hexagon and eventually gluing hexagon back together into a free point function. So there are many questions that remain, like can we fix these divergences at, at wrapping order and more ambitious one which can we use also this hexagon maybe to, to, uh, to, to uh, tessellate uh, a bigger object like this string loop and so on? So uh, we don't know, but hopefully we, we will know in, in, in the future. So here is a summary that you can bring home if you want to. Thank you. Questions? What would it take to prove this, this conjecture that this is how you, the correct computation? Uh, to, to prove that what we are doing is correct? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we, we don't know. We don't know how to prove because we are, you see we are using intuition coming from the gauge theory, intuition coming from the string theory, we put everything in a shaker, we shake a lot and we get what we get. So. How do we actually um, prove that this is the right way of doing it? Seems very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. In the formulas that you showed, us, there was a zeta of three yeah. in the next term after the first term. If you continue yes. to higher order corrections, do you get only Riemann zeta values, or do you get other numbers that you don't know? Or yeah. So uh, currently, we don't know because if we want. Sorry? Numerically. Can you do this numerically? The first few coefficients. So the, so the first few coefficients we, we could imagine doing numerically, but if I really want to go to higher loops, I will have to fix this problem that I've mentioned, these divergences that we have. So I can tell you what is the expectation, but it's not something that we have uh, uh, derived or even observed yet. So the expectation is that we will only get multiple zeta values. Yeah. Not just not, not just Riemann. We can have also this single valued. Um, these are Riemann? Single value. Not yeah, single valued. Uh, yeah. This, this is the expectation based on what is known for this, uh, this kind of integral. But it's, at the moment, if we really compute something, we get infinity. So is infinity a zeta value? I don't know. So, so you mentioned string loops at the very end of your last slide. Can you comment on the prospect of integrability beyond the planar limit? 
Yeah, so um, it, it is well known that if we, if, we, uh, if we look at the spectrum of our operator and so on beyond the planar limit, uh, integrability seems broken. Okay, so in particular, if we do computation at finite ends, integrability seems broken. Um, nonetheless, we know from, from, from the string theory that everything is made out of the same world sheet, and this world sheet is locally integrable. Okay, so if we just take a little piece of world sheet and ask what is the dynamics of this world sheet, the answer is it's an integrable dynamics. So the idea is that if we know all these patches and if we glue them together, we can virtually access to whatever we want. Virtually. So that will mean that integrability could help us constructing uh, the string theory to any other in one over n. Okay? So it does not mean that the integrability remains at finite n because there is a gap between one over n and, and finite n, but we might hope that this is, uh, that this is correct. Other questions? Well, if not, let's thank Benjamin again. Thank you. And I was asked to make an announcement after the morning.